Welcome one and all. Today we've got special guests with me. We've got Brett Bartlett and we've got David Pereka. Hello. Essentially, this is uh, our team for the translation of Marsilio Ficino's De Cristiana Religione. And we're going to be having kind of an informal chat today um, about our work on that book and why we decided to translate it and, and why it's been interesting and put some anecdotes out there about our project. Uh, so maybe David, would you like to tell us about the very beginnings of our project in January when we began? Right. Well, yourself, Dan, and myself have worked uh, before on a previous, on another translation this uh, of a, an astral magic text entitled Picatrix, and that worked out very nicely. And in the process of working on your PhD dissertation, Dan, uh, under my supervision, you were, uh, you've been investigating uh, Renaissance humanists and their reaction to the study of history and the, pro the prophetic tradition and Kabbalah and so on. Uh, and you came across, and Marcio Ficino looms large in that story, uh, and you came across this text, the Cristiana Religione, that no one had translated into English before, first of all, and secondly, uh, it is largely under-recognized, I would say, in terms of the general perception of Ficino as a scholar and as a thinker. He is j largely uh, recognized for his uh, philological work and translation work in terms of bringing the com the uh, complete works of Plato uh, to the a Western audience, translating being the first one to translate the bulk of them from ancient Greek into Latin, and thereby sort of renewing the entire Platonist tradition in Western thought. So, and he has this reputation of as of being a, a great scholar and so on, but he is also. Uh, he was also, first of all, a priest, and secondly, deeply steeped in the in currents of thought that are that modern scholars and observers might describe as very medieval rather than humanistic. And that's where this work in particular comes in. Most other scholarship has focused on Ficino's work as a philologist, as a humanist, and so on. Uh, and this aspect has been seems to have been downplayed, uh, whether intentionally or not. Uh, but this sort of sits somewhat perpendicular to a lot of the rest of his works. I was just going to say that uh, in terms of humanism, what we get is this historiographical mirage where humanism, in part, is, yes, born out of the Greco-Roman classics and the recovery of these texts in Latin, but also they're using very similar scholarly methods that were being used throughout the Middle Ages by Jewish scholars, especially in reading their own sacred texts in the original languages that they had been written in. So that's where this kind of impulse to formal purity comes from, or it's concomitant with what you see in the Jewish world. Um, you don't often hear about that. You, you mostly hear these kind of narratives in the Jacob Burkhardian sense of, of sort of this grand triumphant European emergence of individualist consciousness and things like that. And while there is some of that, it isn't really as important to the, the humanist as the really the philological practice of, of digging into ancient texts and trying to get back at the source, the, the return ad fontes, as they call it. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, of Ficino's own work, this stands out as being extremely polemical in tone and intent. The De Cristiana Religione. It is uh, putting forward um, the argument, essentially, that the Jews have been wrong about their maintenance of their own faith in the face of the existence of Christianity. And the work aims to use Jewish uh, arguments and sources in order to make that point, which is largely different from and perpendicular to really what uh, is broadly perceived as humanism, I would say. Right. So I think that now that we've gotten sort of a very basic idea of what the text is about, uh, I want to give a little bit of historical context. And that is that uh, Ficino is writing in Florence. He is 
Uh, he has become a priest in the year 1473. And um, if we look on this slide here, we can see the world of Christendom was shrinking more and more with every passing decade for quite some time. So there was great anxiety over the coming of the Ottoman Empire. And with the, the fall of Constantinople in 1453, that really sealed the deal in terms of Christendom is in trouble and we need to band together all Latin Christians, in fact, all Latin and Greek Christians as well, and we need to come together in one giant societas Christiana to fight off the infidel Turk. And that, that's happening in the East. Meanwhile, in the West, we have um, ever-increasing persecution of Jews. And we have these persecutions ramping up. And these really started in the uh, 13th century, but they start to gain steam throughout the 14th and 15th centuries. And Ficino very much taps into this tradition of Spanish Dominican authors who are ex-Jews and they are writing out against Jewish thinkers, especially philosophers like Maimonides, who was commenting on Averroes. What Ficino imagines or thinks is that the world is going to get washed away with a diluvium. There will be some sort of apocalyptic event whereby the world order as it stood would be cleansed and the so-called Iron Age that they lived in would revert back to uh, a golden age. And now Ficino had in his mind connected this with astrology. So we have in uh, 1484, the great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, which he envisioned as this reunion of wisdom, Saturn, and divine law, Jupiter. And this is very much what De Christiana Religione is about, is, is about setting up the stage for the return of a priest king, a Saturnine Jupiterian ruler, who is essentially Christ. Ficino makes frequent mention of Melchizedek, whose name also means, you know, king, priest, and he is supposed to be a prefiguration of Christ in the Old Testament. And so uh, Ficino is attempting to bring back this theocratic mode of rule. And eventually he gets it in Savonarola, but he's actually quite uh, displeased with, with the results of that. But I think that that sort of sets the stage for the anxieties that Ficino has and why is he trying to reform Christianity. So uh, we have the Ottoman Empire in the East, we have, uh, we have the Jews in the West, and then we also have the schoolmen in the universities. And Ficino himself, he was a med school dropout, and he, but he, he learned quite a bit in the universities, and he was quite familiar with Aristotle. But he really was not interested in all of these new modes of thought. So you have the, the Via Moderna and the Via Antiqua. So Via Antiqua was Thomas Aquinas and Albertus Magnus and these kinds of thinkers. And then the Via Moderna was more of the nominalist thinkers. And, you know, uh, Duns Scotus, Thomas Aquinas, these kinds of thinkers. And Ficino wasn't really interested in these debates. He thought that, that the truth had fragmented into so many parts and that really Christendom, East and West, could be reunited if only they recovered that, that pristine moment in time when Christianity was one body. And that moment is to Ficino, the primitive church. Um, his vision of the primitive church is one almost, it's, it is sprung fully formed from the head of God. It, 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 it wasn't one of great division as it would become to later historians. 
Ficino saw this as a kind of golden age that was rooted in the belief in the Prisca Theologia. Now, the Prisca Theologia is another story that we can get into. Uh, doctor, would you like to touch on the Prisca Theologia? Sure. Uh, Prisca Theologia essentially is the belief in um, a primitive perception of divine truth by early philosopher king sages. Um, among them would be counted uh, Zoroaster, uh, Pythagoras, uh, Hermes Trismegistus, uh, and among the Jews, Moses would qualify. Uh, and these were thought to be uh, humans who had the proverbial red phone to God uh, and expressed themselves in poetic and cryptic ways uh, because divine truths are difficult to perceive uh, by human minds. So it was seen as a time when people were more connected. So the time of the, the Prisci Theologi was a time when uh, people were more closely connected uh, and more closely aware of divine truths. And that's why those times qualified as a golden age. Right. Excellent. And what's important in Ficino vis-a-vis -vis history is that for him the Prisca Theologia narrative becomes a kind of map of early history. He can see this passing on of the relay torch from one generation to another through a series of successive philosophers. Um, so we get, uh, you know, the furthest lowest reach is Plato, but behind Plato we have Pythagoras, and behind Pythagoras we have um, Agliophemus and Zalmoxis and Orpheus, and behind these guys we have uh, Zoroaster and, and Hermes and Moses, and there is this chronological rendering of the history of philosophy, and Ficino very much builds his history from that scaffolding, in addition to the Bible, of course, because these are thought of as parallel traditions. And that's something really important about the humanist mind is that it's not so much one of syncretism, it's one of parallelisms. And you can even see this in the structure of De Christiana Religione. The first half deals with Plato and the pagan world, and then the second half deals almost exclusively with the Hebrew prophets. And, you know, in the middle you get sort of this stuff about the Sibyls who kind of are a, a gray area in between the two. So, we've talked about this. How do you resolve a crisis? Ficino says, through the word of God, men had previously been formed, and through the same word, they ought to be reformed, and deservingly so, for through the light of the intellectual word, the darkness of the human intellect must be expelled. The rational animal must be corrected through the reason of God. So essentially, Ficino thinks that the one thing that rises above entropy and decay is language. And he's certainly not wrong in this, but for him, there is sort of an archetypal form of what good language constitutes, and that is the Gospels. So, in his mind, Christ is the platonic form of man, and when he speaks, the words he says, they, they essentially constitute divine law, or natural law, if you will. And Ficino's idea is that if we can somehow all get ourselves back to this business of following the divine law, which he elucidates throughout the book, then we will get ourselves out of this crisis. We will somehow roll into a new golden age and be uh, illuminated by the platonic sun. Uh, I just wanted to ask quick, Dan, uh, just to jump in, uh, uh, why it is that you equate divine law and natural law in, this, in what you just said? Well, natural law, especially with its history in Thomism, is very much what the Sermon on the Mount circumscribes. It's about, you know, not doing unto others what you would not have them do to you. We have this section in Ficino where he concisely says what the gist of Christianity is. It's, it's, you know, he says, turn the other cheek, 
do unto others what you would have them do unto you, and and so forth. And these, this is the nut or the essence of of what the Christian religion is. And in Ficino's mind, Jews and Muslims cannot be the heirs of the true faith because they don't practice that. In his mind, you know, Jews are are greedy and somehow carnal, and therefore they're incapable of this higher level of spiritual understanding of the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law, which is why they cling to the traditions of their ancestors, rather than being focused on this very simple message that Jesus says, you know, love your neighbor and love God. Those are the two laws that all the other laws of the prophets rest upon. I, I nearly wanted to avoid confusion to a, a modern audience that natural law sounds like the law of gravity and this kind of thing. Oh, right. Yes. Well, I mean, we can get into that natural bit of, of Ficino as well. Um, De Cristiana Religione is very much also an appeal to nature. It has this kind of naturalist uh, approach whereby Ficino connects, when we talk about nature, and maybe, Brett, you want to touch on this, that when we talk about nature, we talk about things that are connected to birth. So do you, do you want to talk about that? Uh, I'm, I guess I can, I was just looking up a quote right now from Ficino. I got to get in the habit of actually calling, pronouncing his name correctly. And, yeah, one thing about nature is that uh, it, it does come from the Latin verb nascar, uh, to be born, and Pino is very much aware of this etymology. Um, I'm just digging right now for chapter two of, or chapter one of, uh, on the Christian religion, and, uh, and I'll just get the quote up. This natural and shared belief about God was put in us by God, our shared origin and the author of our natures. We ought also to remember that the divination which happens in an entire species of animals, since it happens at the impulse of a universal and a particular nature, is true. So this is Ficino going on to talk about divination. But the big point of this, for why I cite it, is because he sees things that are natural as being implanted at birth or innate. And for uh, Ficino, religion is natural. And he describes later on at the end of chapter one of on the Christian religion, uh, man as a, I guess I think the, I got to find the Latin to be sure, but an abomination. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was monstrum is the word he used, but it could have been prodigium. Anyway, that the proper uh, religious practices in his mind are so uh, innate to humanity that it is unnatural, an aberration to not follow these laws. Right. So the way that Ficino envisions this is that the true religion of man is the one that is concerned with self-sacrifice or just sacrifice. And that animals don't do this kind of stuff. And if, it, and if they do, then it, it, they're doing something else and it, it's, it's something altogether different, according to Ficino. But and the, the true religion is the religion of sacrifice and this is what binds together all pagans all jews all christians everybody believes in sacrifice and that was the religion implanted into us by god it, it's our shared inheritance and so he's saying that there is of course, this comes later, but that there, there is an ultimate sacrifice that puts an end to this sacrificial, natural religion. And that Christianity is the culmination of the religion of sacrifice, whereby God sacrifices himself to himself. An another important part of the natural element for Ficino is this idea that animals in nature can foretell certain events. So there's all kinds of divination practices that are used 
where you observe the flight of birds or bats or whatever it may be, and you can determine from watching the patterns of animals what kind of weather events are going to happen. And Ficino stretches that analogy uh, to human beings who themselves have these ability to have these premonitions. And um, I, to jump in there, I'll yeah. just pick up that quote that I cut off earlier. So after going through all these other sites to show how you can divine with birds or other animals, Ficino says, religion, therefore, is true by the shared divination of man. For everyone has always worshipped God everywhere for the sake of the life to come. That is to say, if all birds moving in one direction can foretell a fog, then certainly all humans engaging in worship of some divine are, in fact, an indication of the existence of the divine. So, where this sacrifice stuff all sort of ties in is into, well, Christian spirituality uh, in general, but specifically mendicant spirituality, because the mendicant orders were very much interested in the 13th century with seeking out martyrdom, seeking out extreme self-abnegation, extreme self-sacrifice, self-renunciation, etc., in order to essentially fly straight to heaven and into the throne room of God, where you would dwell eternally in, in felicitas, is the word that they use. So, Ficino is attempting to use these principles of self-sacrifice and renunciation and demonstrating why the true religion is Christianity because Christianity calls for these things, whereas Islam is lascivious and therefore it's a lustful religion. When you go to paradise, there's virgins and so forth. It's, a, it's, not, it's not a religion of the spirit. It's a religion of the flesh, he argues. And very much the same for Judaism. And these are harping on old tropes that go back to polemical mendicant literature, especially converso literature. And we'll, we'll get into that soon. So we've talked about this, the, the many faces of Ficino, how uh, we have Ficino as a humanist. He's this guy that translates Plato. He writes these beautiful letters that have been collected. He invented the idea of platonic love, for example. Um, th that's, that's something that we, we think of when we think of Ficino. I think, if I remember, there's a book where the title of the book is something like Marsilio Ficino, the Friend of Mankind. And, and that is one sort of face of Ficino. That, that, that's the really polished Florentine Ficino that we, we get in some of his letters and, and those sorts of works. Then we get Ficino the Platonist, and this is the Ficino of um, the Platonic theology on the immortality of the soul. It's the Ficino of the first half of De Christiana Religione. It's the, it's the writer of commentaries or the translator of the Neoplatonists. So this is another aspect or face of Ficino that we get. And then we get F Ficino the Magus, which is, I think, the face of Ficino that really draws people in. This was the Ficino that was presented by Francis Yates' uh, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition. And uh, also D.P. Walker's book, um, Spiritual and Demonic Magic from Ficino to Campanella. Th this aspect of Ficino is really present mainly in the De Vita Libri Tres, which is one of his later works. And that's the one that borrows from the Picatrix and interacts with some of the more obscure works of the Neoplatonists. But then the Ficino that we're turning to is Ficino the Priest uh, of De Cristiana Religione. So if, if we're examining Ficino the Priest, one of the main um, elements of Ficino's priestly scholarship, you could say, is what I call the Latin polemical tradition, and especially the anti-Judaic, anti-Islamic, anti-pagan, anti-heretical polemical tradition that was started by the church fathers, and it kind of died down for some time, um, 
and then as Christians started becoming more and more into contact with, uh, with foreigners in the 12th century, for example, during the, the beginning of the Crusader era, we start to see a rise again of these polemical works. There are more anti-Jewish polemical works written in uh, the 13th century, I believe, than in the entirety of the time before it. So all of the centuries preceding it, there weren't as many anti-Jewish polemical work as in the 13th century. And Ficino is very much influenced by this tradition. This is one of the traditions that you don't often see people talk about when they're talking about Ficino. And there are historiographical reasons behind that. We don't really need to get into them here. But one of the main elements of that tradition was this idea of appealing to the spirit of the word. And what I mean by that is both Christians and Jews had developed for quite some time since I think the fourth century or AD rather uh, multiple levels of scriptural exegesis. They had uh, at the base, they had the plain literal sense or the historical sense. Then you move up a level and then you have the allegorical sense and then you move up a level above that. You have the moral sense and then above that you have the mystical sense. And so when you read scripture, you were supposed to read them on multiple levels in this sort of kaleidoscope. And that's how you allowed for texts to be both very, you know, simple pastoral matters and also uh, the inner workings of the divine simultaneously. So one of the major thinkers in the Latin polemical tradition in the 11th or rather 12th century is Petrus Alfonsi. Uh, we can see him here on the slide and he's talking with um, his pre-Christian Jewish alter ego, Moses Sephardi. So Petrus Alfonsi, Moses Sephardi, they're the same uh, people. They're just two aspects of himself. And they debate about all manner of uh, religious and philosophical things. And, and, you know, there's a lot of straw manning going on, but by and large, Petrus Alfonsi sets the tone for how this polemical tradition is going to lay out. And the main thing he does, and I'll just read the quote here, he says, so you have the character of Moses saying, if you introduce some authority from scriptures, do this according to the actual Hebrew, because if you do otherwise, you know that I will not accept it. And Petrus responds, certainly I do not refuse this, for I desire greatly to slay you with your own sword. So starting in the 12th century, we get this crusader mindset being applied to theology and the culture of theological debates. And the main way that they think of themselves as waging war is by raiding the armories of their opponents and using their own weapons against them. That is the dominant metaphor within this tradition. So that starts with Petrus Alfonsi and it runs through a series of authors, which we can get into at some other time, and eventually culminates for our purposes in Ficino. So if we look at the actual layout of the sources that Ficino are using, you know, we're not getting this, um, Ficino the Platonist or Ficino the Magician, you know, there, there are only 15 references to Plato, one reference to Porphyry, one reference to Proclus, one reference to Michael Tselos or Pseudo Tselos, and, and one reference to I Iamblichus, and zero references to Plotinus. You would expect that from Ficino, but here we don't have any of that stuff or we have very little of it. What we do have is huge, huge chunks borrowed from Paul of Burgos, his Scrutinium Scripturarum, uh, 19 references to Jerome of Santa Fe's Contra Judaios, 26 references to Recoldus de Montecrucis's Contra Legem Saracenorum, 12 to Thomas Aquinas's Contra Gentiles, and 10 to Nicholas of Lyra's Quaestiones Disputatae Contra Hebraeus. So this 
is the main DNA of his work. He is chiefly working from these men who used to be Jews, converted to Christianity, became bishops and Dominican monks and so forth, and then turned around and wrote against Jewish uh, authors using Jewish texts like Talmudic literature and various other types of exegetical works. Later, we'll see Pico get into things like Kabbalistic commentaries of the Bible. But in Ficino, we have inklings of that, but he doesn't come out and talk about Kabbalah in a fully-fledged way. So something we have in, in Ficino, we have him echoing these ideas that began as far back as Jerome, and that is that you have to use the Hebraica Veritas, the Hebrew truth or the actual Hebrew text, and you have to levy that against the Judaica falsitas, the, the, the Jewish lies, essentially, the, the mistranslations of the Jews. And only through doing that can you subvert the Jews by using Hebrew literature. So here we have an example of a quote that Ficino says from the 30th chapter of De Christiana Religione, and he says, I make liberal use of the Septuagint translation of the Bible that is not Jerome's Vulgate to convince or prevail against or overwhelm, the Latin verb is convicere, this treacherous Jewish people using the excellent arsenal of those illustrious Jews who translated the Old Testament. And so here he's trying to use this ad fontes humanist approach two texts, but he's using it in a sort of weaponized way. And this is very much in keeping with the spirit of the Dominican Inquisitions and the hedging in of, of Jews in Spain before ultimately uh, their expulsion in 1492 and in Portugal in 1496. So one of the approaches uh, that he uses, and um, I'm not going to read all of this, but it is that Ficino weaponizes philology, and there is a rich tradition of this in the Pugio Fidei of Raymond Marti. Raymond Marti was a Dominican in the 1260s who was put together with a team of translators, and they essentially had to translate as many Midrashic works and Talmudic texts in order to uh, demonstrate how really even in the Jewish works, Christian, uh, Christian Trinitarian things were being prefigured in their works. Uh, you know, Raymond Marti had a knowledge of Hebrew and some knowledge of Aramaic, and this was mainly his approach he was one of the first people really in the Latin West to deal really seriously with Hebrew. You get other people like Roger Bacon and, and Raymond Lull and so forth, and they were all interested in reviving the knowledge of Hebrew, reviving the knowledge of Arabic in the Latin West in order to use them polemically for the imminentizing of a Christian universalism. So... Here, uh, uh, one of the kinds of arguments you see is that in Genesis, the Bible mentions the, the B'nai Elohim, the sons of God. But God never mentions that these sons are begotten. And, and so you see these kinds of arguments at a philological level where we're getting into the nature of very specific words. Here he's saying, you know, this day or thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. So he says, oh, this day, that is in an eternal today, namely that the present status of eternity, which has neither beginning nor end, for whatever is of the substance of God is also eternal within God. Therefore, there is in the psalm, give to the king thy judgment, O God, where it is clearly discussing the son of God. And so you get a tremendous amount of uh, trying to locate Christ or hints of Christ within the books of the prophets and specifically at the level of letters and words. So a uh, further example here is 
Regarding the Son himself, it is said, His name will be forevermore, and his name sprouteth before the Son. The fact, however, that where our translation says sprouteth, the Hebrew has inon, which is in fact a word derived from nun, and nun means son. This makes clear that the discussion is about the eternal Son of God. Therefore, what else does Enon signify but a son, begotten, born, and perfected? So here you see Ficino tapping into these um, Jewish traditions that are not known outside of Judaism, whereby specific letters are equated with full nouns. And so here the letter Nun is sometimes equated with the word offspring. And so he's saying, look, the letter Nun he made sure to use that in order to signify that Christ is the Son of God. And that's, that's just one of many, many, many examples that he uses throughout. Another thing that he does is he uses history and prophecy. And he talks about timing. And there was a rich tradition of debating throughout the Middle Ages the timing of when the Messiah should come. Does he come at the end of history? Does he come in the middle of history? And Ficino, based on his Platonic assumptions, has Christ transect time down the middle. Not only is Christ transecting the great chain of being in the, in the sense that he occupies the body of a man who sits in the absolute middle of the great chain of being, but he also transects time. In, in the perfect middle. And these are these really Pythagorean assumptions that he is applying to understanding Christianity and refuting Judaism. So maybe to uh, wrap up my little bit, I have this graph here where you can see the chain of the Latin polemical tradition as it flows through Marsilio Ficino. And uh, I think this is really something that De Christiana Religione will help to elucidate in Ficino. We'll, we'll have a whole new uh, face of Ficino that we can understand. And, and it is this, this one born out of Christian polemics, not just an appreciation for the Greco-Roman classics, which is often how he is portrayed. So do you guys want to add anything to that? It's a, it's a pretty thorough er, overview, Dan, of um, uh, situating the Cristiana Religione both within the tradition of works that it belongs to, as well as within um, the bio-bibliography, I guess, of Ficino's life. Um, and I particularly appreciate the, the, the tripartite division of his works that you presented earlier um, and, and the comments you made on it. Right. Maybe something I should mention. One of the things that we find in Ficino is actually a discussion and reference to the Tetragrammaton. And he does this with Latin letters, and he actually speculates on what the vowels are. And this is interesting because this directly ties into the tradition of Petrus Alfonsi and of Joachim of Fior and of uh, ultimately Johannes Reuchlin, who comes, well, he, he was a contemporary with Ficino, but also he lived quite a bit longer. In this, we see an attempt to make the Tetragrammaton uh, proof of, of Christianity, proof of the Trinitarian nature of the name of God, because there's so many passages in the Bible that say, you know, you'll do miracles in the name of God. You can, you can cast out demons or raise the dead or or what have you. And there are many prophecies in the Old Testament that say things like, on that day, his name shall be one. So there was this great speculation for many centuries as to what is the real name of God. And what they ultimately settled on, through the help of Petrus Alfonsi bringing the Hebrew tradition in from the Spanish world into the Latin West, and he brings it in Hebrew and demonstrates, well, you have these three pairs across the four letters, and they are always rotating, and the, these are the internal dynamics within God. So we get these sort of pre-Kabbalistic speculations being done in a Trinitarian mode, and that sort of sets the pattern for 
Christian interactions with mystical Jewish thought. And then it really gets Latinized and Christianized in the thought of Joachim of Fior, who uses that tetragrammaton in order to map out history. He demonstrates how the age of the father is governed by the IE, the age of the son is governed by the EU, and the age of the spirit is governed by the UE. And um, at the end of time, all of these names will be one. And what Reuchlin ultimately did in the end was he took the the shin, the three-pronged Hebrew letter shin, and stuffed it in the middle of the tetragrammaton. And what that did was, in his mind, give breath to the tetragrammaton and made an unpronounceable, lifeless word full of life and spirit. So Yehovah became Yeshua. And that this is sort of one of the great mysteries that they are trying to uncover uh, not only the divine names, how they interact with the tree of life, since there are men, many divine names, but also how to use its power and return to dwell in the heavenly throne room of the angels, immortal, like a, a divine being that's very much part of Ficino's shtick, is that you are not God. You are definitely not God. God is the Trinity, but you are divine you are immortal and you go to dwell in this in the throne room of god with all of the angels eternally and that is the ultimate beatific state that you can exist in and the only way to do that is by emulating god is by emulating christ who is the archetypal platonic form of man and so yeah that is essentially De Christiana Religione in a nutshell. Um, it is a large work. It's it's 38 chapters, if I'm not mistaken, or 37 with a with a premium. And it covers the whole gamut of arguments in in this vein. Um, I was wondering if we wanted to talk a little bit about style, since Brett, you're more more inclined to speak on on these sorts of matters. Do you have any overarching thoughts about Ficino's Latin, um, about, about any uh, thoughts on our translation, uh, that sort of thing? All right. So I haven't been speaking much, so I, I'm not going to open this up with a string of cursing Ficino's Latin. <laughs> you can. <laughs> His Latin is a... It's a... It's, I'm actually not all that too well read in medieval Latin. However, from what I am, it is in many ways very classical in style. In other ways, it reads almost like Italian at times. So as far as I'd say about his Latin is you can tell that he is trying to uh, create a synthesis of styles. Um, there's very much little learned uh, notes to show that he's read Livy here. A, a phrase or two borrowed from Horace or Virgil there, and a lot of a lot of biblical language that just gets thrown into the mix from the Vulgate. In addition to that, you can you can also tell at times that he is very much a product of his times. So uh, we had one really difficult time translating the word instrumentum until we looked into a 1611. Italian dictionary and found out it was a a legal term in a Florin the Florentine Republic. It's a it's very um, inconsistent in style. It really depends on who he's pulling from at any given time. He tends to take on characteristics of um, Eusebius's um, Preparatio Evangelica or Evangelica when um, he's talking about early church fathers and the times of persecution but uh when we are talking when we're doing the polemical against the jews chapter it's almost word for word paul of burgos and his style and you start seeing ways that paul of burgos begins his sentences showing up in ficino that you didn't see before right heck ile yeah um 
Yeah, hey. that's what he said. Yeah, so he said. Um, well, the other one, ex quo patet. From this, it is clear that is, we didn't see that before. What chapter twenty six? There, there was one or two yeah. before twenty seven, when um he starts using Paul of Burgos more, and all of a sudden, all these sentences start beginning with Paul of Burgos's favorite phrase. So. Yeah, he definitely wears his uh, influences heavily. Yes. Uh, something something worth diving into at this point, I think, is the relationship between the Latin version of Ficino's De Cristiana Religione and the Italian translation oh, yes. that he himself made of it. I know, we've been... So, Brett, you hinted at uh, the need to reference the Italian language in our translation. Uh, this is... this is obviously because Ficino himself is Italian and his native tongue is Italian, so it stands to reason that he would think first and foremost in Italian and then sort of tra- put that into Latin as best he was able or as best his sources expressed it for him uh, in some cases. So uh, Yeah, I guess one thing I'd say from that is, and it's been kind of a pain when trying to give primacy to either Italian or Latin when we're doing this translation, is while he is an Italian speaker first and foremost, he'll often uh, he the tr- translations match up very closely in vocabulary and in syntax. And often you'll have Ficino trying to uh, fit a Latin word into its Italian derivative, and uh, other times trying to fit the Italian into the Latin and. It doesn't really make any sense until you read the other version and see, oh, okay, that doesn't make any sense as instrumentum, but as strumento in a 15th century Italian document, it makes perfect sense. And so many times, Latin technical words are just completely moved into Italian as if, you know, just changed the declension, had an O to the end, and... Bam, it's Italian. Yeah. But it, or, or an A, as the case may be. <laughs> yes, exactly. But in any event, it's a very idiosyncratic use of Italian, whereas it's pretty standard Latin. Or vice versa. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, so so the, uh, the Italian version was printed, so the Latin version was written from... 1473 to 1474 and it was translated into Italian virtually right after and then the Italian version was printed first in 74 and then the Latin version was printed two years later in 76 and this was intended to be a kind of foreword to his printing of his 18 book platonic theology against of Arroways and, and uh, Lucretius. But yeah, uh, we definitely took into consideration the Latin or and the Italian when we were doing our translation. We weighed more toward the uh, Latin, of course, but there were instances where the Italian made things so much clearer oh. as to what he was intending. Oh, yeah. Often he would, uh, he would often create a bit of a muddle of a sentence in Latin, often being very ambiguous about what was going on. And then the Italian would replace all these uh, pronouns, or not even pronouns, just just a lack of pronouns with proper nouns, which is, I think, the last time we had the Italian bail us out and we were going through it. Um, but- Right. I was just going to say that uh, considering the dates that uh, Dan, you just mentioned, the context in his own career of the writing of this text is in fact that he had just become ordained in the pre- as a priest, and this is the first thing he wrote thereafter. And I think that's an important thing to note, considering uh, that this is uh, Ficino's major manifestation as a Catholic thinker in, in a very medieval tradition. Um, and motivated perhaps by the additional zeal of having been ordained very recently and so on. Yeah, it, it's very much a demonstration of his good faith, and it is very much in keeping with the Latin polemical tradition that you write anti-Jewish works in order to demonstrate your good faith. The, the impact that you plan that work on having is very limited. 
uh, there's, it's mostly for preaching to the choir. And, and if you wanted to really engage with Jews, you would do it in their own languages. I, you wouldn't do it in Latin. Oh, sorry, go on. I was going to say, now that we've, we're talking about the historical context of Ficino's career and the uh, uh, kind of anti-Jewish polemical uh, tradition, do you want to talk about the, some more historical context or do you have a slide saved for that later? Nope, I, I'm pretty much done with the slides and we're just freeballing for now. Okay, um, so 1474 is when this is written. I have some very cursory knowledge of what happened at that point. If anyone, ha if you, either of you guys have a greater understanding of the events, uh, feel free to take it. But there was the issue of Simon of Trent. So the uh, a case of a blood libel accusation against the Jews of Trent, where uh, eventually trials were had and there were people killed over this false accusation that would later spill into Regensburg around the time of the printing of the Latin edition. And do you know what year that was? Uh, the uh, blood libel trials of Trent were 74 to 75. I actually do not have a date on the top of my head for Regensburg, right. but it was hot on the heels of that. Well, so one of the perhaps more influential uh, anti-Semitic thinkers, I don't know if we call Jerome of Santa Fe anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish. He was himself Jewish at one point in his life. But in any case, Jerome of Santa Fe as an anti-Jewish writer influenced Ficino in, in huge part, but was also a major part of Martin Luther's On the Jews and Their Lies. And so we have on both sides of the Alps uh, these people uh, imbibing Dominican uh, anti-Jewish converso literature and it manifests itself in, in very different ways, but it was as influential in Italy as it was in, in Germany. Yeah. Um, and I'm seeing the, sorry. Oh yeah. I'm just seeing that the Regensburg uh, incident started in 1476. Right. So just pretty much the same year as De Christiana Religione was printed in Latin. Now, we can't draw a direct line from the one event to the other, but it just, it sort of highlights the, the tone and gives us some context for what the attitudes were at this point. And, you know, leading up to 1492, when we get these really mass e exiles, um, I mean, those, those weren't the first, of course, but they, that does provide context for the, the kinds of, work that Ficino is doing and, and would also be echoed by Pico uh, not long after. About 10 years later, you have Pico writing his disputations in 1486, writing the Heptaplus in 14, I think, 88, 89. And, and these are also, in a sense, uh, Kabbalistic anti-Jewish works. They're, they're written with the guidance of Jewish teachers, but largely converso teachers. And most of the time, the intent for Pico is to say, you know, where, where, you, where your traditions agree with us, we, we're fine. You can keep them. But where you differ, we will draw up in Catholic legions and assault you. And that, that's very much the tone of, of his polemics, of Ficino's polemics. And it's all rooted in this tradition you uh, Brett, did you want to talk about the just as an anecdote the rap some of the problems with names that we've run into and how it's forced us to dig into Jerome of Santa Fe, Paul of Burgos, even Raymond Marty sometimes. Well, the problem. Well, Eusebius was the first place I started digging because that was when we had problems with just Greek names, but Ficino will often. Not uh, not always through fault of his own. I, first, I was quick to fault Ficino. But now that I've poured through some old print editions of uh, the Preparatio Evangelica and stuff like that, I see that the sources he was working with also made similar mistakes right. uh, as the ones we're finding. But it's just how non-standardized spelling was. Uh, 
how names kind of just wandered over centuries of manuscript tradition when it's these marginal people on the sidelines of history just being mentioned once. And so I'm going to, you get, you start getting odd vowel shifts here. So an E for an A uh, in one name. So we had a, we had Conan, which I think was a, spelled a comus or something we have various just m's for n's uh my favorite one that that we spent an hour digging into trying to figure out how he made this mistake was um barkokva or barkosiba or benkosiba various names in this tradition for the uh, leader of the jewish revolt during hadrian's reign uh, i think it's 127 to 131 I could be wrong there. Just top, top. 130, 132 to one thirty-five. One okay, one thirty-two. I knew it was a few a few years, and that was about it. But anyway, Barkakva, we have him showing up as Ven, Vento Zara in Ficino, and I, I didn't know how he got that. Eventually, we did find it in Paul and in a print edition of Paul of Burgos. The 1471 print edition as well, where it's Ventazra. So we're imagine. I can't imagine a uh, Paul of Burgos would have gotten that incorrect, but you can see how even in the copying names that may have been correct get corrupted, and then the person working from that book just passes it on as is as he saw. And it. dictation. So or corrupts it a little bit more, such as Ventazra to Ventozara. And what's really interesting about that is because Ficino didn't even realize that Ven Ven Ventazra or Ventazara was um, Barkokva, he goes on a few, a few paragraphs later in the same chapter to also talk about Barkospa. As if he were a different character. Yes. Yeah, and then he complains that the Jews have so many messiahs, and <laughs> like, he's using two two examples of the same person with a different name as his example of the many messiahs. I know it's like oh, oh. <laughs> Another couple of languages, uh, a couple of comments on the uh, um, translation and how we've proceeded with it as well, in terms of how Ficino deals with quotations from the Vulgate. Now, it's become fairly obvious that the, the critical edition of the Vulgate that we uh, use as scholars today ha often has very different readings from uh, w what Ficino quotes, which is surprising coming from a, a very well-educated priest, uh, or would be surprising if there weren't actual differences between uh, the Vulgate that Ficino had access to, the text, the, the text that he had to hand, versus what scholars have uh, pulled together since then in today's printed versions. Uh, in our translation, we've uh, generally cleaved toward retaining the English wording that appears in the Douai Reims uh, translation of the Bible, simply because those readings uh, oftentimes um, correspond more closely to, what, uh, to the wording in Ficino's own text. Yes. Um, so, just wanted to put that out there. That... That was actually a really interesting thing to start seeing it where Ficino's text differs markedly from the Vulgates we're looking at. But when we're looking at this translation we decided to use, because it is a 16th century, I believe, translation yep, yep. of English from the Vulgate, the translator clearly had something closer to what Ficino was looking at than what we are. And that was, that was a godsend for deciding how to handle Bible, uh, Bible quotes. Yeah, which are quite numerous. Because sometimes you, yeah, often uh, authors will harmonize. So, for example, I read one translation of Pico's Heptapolis that used King James to harmonize the, the, the Latin Bible quotes, but King James is based on a Greek text or a collection of texts. And uh, the Douay Rhymes is specifically built on the Vulgate of, of the 16th century. And so we clung to using Douay Rhymes. We find that, uh, yeah, they, it, it often elucidates certain things about 
what Ficino was intending that we may not necessarily as modern English readers would, would glean. Another, com- I want to pick up on something you hinted at earlier, Brett, uh, regarding the practice of dictation. Uh, there are multiple instances, uh, especially in the first half of the, the work uh, of Ficino's De Cristiana Religione, where the misspellings that appear in the text we have are cl- appear quite clearly to be the result of uh, a, a mishearing of words that Ficino must have been saying out loud. Scribal yeah. errors that are the result of the of the direct process of of a work being dictated, uh, rather than misspellings that could occur if a text was being copied or written um, straight from the person's head to the person's pen. And well, I'm sure you you thought of that when I was talking about Ventozara, because my pet exactly. theory is that what that was a a copying error before it became print, but still in the manuscript tradition given the closeness of B of how well B would become V in a uh, dictation. Yeah. And I just remembered what I was going to say before, and it comes to uh, wh- one other reason why we are happy with the uh, Dewey rhymes. And that is the style of the Vulgate is different than the style that Ficino writes in. And it is really nice to be able to have a different voice than that of the translators to cite the Bible in, to give that sense that it, this is coming from a different source than Ficino. Whereas if we translated everything, it would start reading as if it's all Ficino. Mm-hmm. And so, as what Dan was talking about earlier with harmonizing, it does give a nice, distinct tone to the quotes. Yeah. All right, so I think we've touched on everything, and maybe we should let people know when this work is coming out. Uh, I guess we don't exactly know ourselves. We're something like 70% through our final revision. Yeah, it's about two-thirds done at this point, um, and at the rate of work we've been maintaining, we're hoping to have the rest of it done within a month, uh, at which point we would uh, need to take some time to integrate all of the scholarly annotations, the footnotes, and so on, as well as polish up the introdu- the written introduction to the text. All of this is to be submitted to the University of Toronto Press for uh, sending to anonymous peer review, and that process is um, how long does it take? Well, how long is a string? Um, because it all yeah. depends on uh, the deadlines that the press itself sets, followed by how well respected those deadlines are by the anonymous reviewers who end up being uh, who end up volunteering. Uh, so uh, we're hoping uh, in an in in uh, in an optimistic scenario, I would say sometime 2021, this should appear. Yeah, optimistically. But that's an optimistic scenario. Yep. Yeah. 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 Late 2021. But late late 2021. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like it could be possible, but we'll, we we don't hold our breath in this in this game. <laughs> no, yeah, especially in this day and age. All right. Well, uh, I'd like to thank you, gentlemen, for giving me your time. Uh, we actually used a, a. We've been translating every day for the past, or practically every day for the past however many months, and uh, we've decided to use today's translation session to talk publicly about some of this stuff and uh, build some some interest. So yeah, uh, thanks again for joining us and uh, we'll see you again soon. Cheerio. Thank you very much, Dan, for having us on your show. Yes, thank you, Dan.